Good morning, friends. We are on chapter 12. Through the stable door. Jill ought to have been back at the White Rock already, but she had quite forgotten that part of her orders in the excitement of watching the fight. Now she remembered. She turned at once and ran to it, and arrived there barely a second before the others. It thus happened that all of them, for a moment, had their backs to the enemy. They all wheeled round the moment they had reached it. A terrible sight met their eyes. A calamine was running toward the stable door, carrying something that kicked and struggled. As he came between them and the fire, they could see clearly both the shape of the man and the shape that he was carrying. The shape of what he carried. It was Eustace. Tyrion and the unicorn rushed out to rescue him, but the calamine was now far nearer to the door than they. Before they had covered half the distance, he had flung Eustace in and shut the door on him. Half a dozen more calamines had run up behind him. They formed a line in the open space before the stable. There was no getting at it now. Even then, Jill remembered to keep her face turned aside, well away from her bow. "'Even if I can't stop blubbing, I won't get my string wet,' she said. "'Where arrows?' said Poggin suddenly. Everyone ducked and, and pulled his helmet well over his nose. The dogs crouched behind. But though a few arrows came their way, it soon became clear that they were not being shot at. Griffel and his dwarves were at their archery again. This time they were coolly shooting at the Calamines. "'Keep it up, boy,' came Griffel's voice. "'All together, carefully, we don't want darkies any more of them than we want monkeys or lions or kings. The dwarfs are for the dwarfs.' "'Whatever else you may say about dwarfs, no one can say that they aren't brave. They could easily have got away to some safe place. They preferred to stay and kill as many as of both sides as they could, except when both sides were kind enough to, to save them the trouble by killing one another. They wanted Narnia for their own.' What perhaps they had not taken into account was that the Kellermines were mail-clad and the horses had had no protection. Also, the Kellermines had a leader. Rishta Tarkan's voice cried out, Thirty of you, keep watch on those fools by the white rock. The rest, after me, that we may teach these sons of earth a lesson. Tyrion and his friends, still panting from their fight, and thankful for a few minutes' rest, stood and looked on while the Tarkan led his men against the dwarfs. It was a strange scene by now. The fire had sunk lower. The light it gave was now less and of a darker red. As, f as far as one could see, the whole place of assembly was now empty except for the dwarfs and the Kellermines. In that light, one couldn't make out much of what was happening. It sounded as if the dwarfs were putting up a good fight. Tyrion could hear Griffel using dreadful language, and every now and then the Tarkan called, "'Take all you can alive! Take them alive!' Whatever that fight may have been like, it did not last long. The noise of it died away. Then Jill saw the Tarkan coming back to the stable. Eleven men followed him, dragging eleven bound dwarves. Whether the others had all been killed, or whether some of them had got away, was never known. "'Throw them into the Shrine of Tosh,' said Rishta Tarkan. And when the eleven dwarves, one after the other, had been flung or kicked into that dark doorway, and the door had been shut again, he bowed low to the stable and said, "'These also are for thy burnt offering, Lord Tosh.' And all the Kellermines banged the flats of their swords on their shields and shouted, "'Tosh! Tosh!' The great god Tosh, inexorable Tosh. There was no nonsense about Toshlan now. The little party by the white rock watched these doings and whispered to one another. They had found a trickle of water coming down the rock, and all had drunk eagerly, Jill and Poggin and the king in their hands. Jill and Poggin and the king in their hands, while the four footed ones lapped from the little pool which, which it had made at the foot of the stone. Such was their thirst that it seemed the most delicious drink they had ever had in their lives, and while they were drinking, they were perfectly happy and could not think of anything else. "'I feel in my bones,' said Poggin, "'that we shall all, one by one, pass through that dark door before morning. I can think of a hundred deaths I, w deaths I would rather have died. "'It is indeed a grim door,' said Tyrion. "'It is more like a mouth.' "'Oh, can't we do anything to stop it?' said Jill in a shaken voice. "'Nay, fair friend,' said Jewel, nosing her gently. It may be for us the door to Aslan's country, and we shall sup at his table tonight. Rishta Tarkan turned his back on the stable and walked slowly to a place in front of the white rock. Hearken, he said, if the boar and the dogs and the unicorn will come over to me and put themselves in my mercy, their lives shall be spared. The boar shall go to a cage in the Tisrock's garden. The dogs to the Tisrock's kennels and the unicorn, when I have sawn his horn off, shall draw a cart. But the eagle, the children, and he who was the king shall be offered to Tosh this night. The only answer was growls. "'Get on, warriors,' said the Tarkan. "'Kill the beasts. Take the two-legged ones alive.' And then the last battle of the last king of Narnia began. What made it hopeless, even apart from the numbers of the enemy, was the spears. 
The Calarmines, who had been with the ape almost from the beginning, had had no spears. That was because they had come into Narnia by ones and twos, pretending to be peaceful merchants. And of course they had carried no spears, for a spear is not a thing you can hide. The new ones must have come in later, after the ape was already strong and they could march openly. The spears made all the difference. With a long spear you can kill a boar before you, you are in reach of his tusks, and a unicorn before you are in, are in reach of his horn, if you are very quick and keep your head. And now the leveled spears were closing in on Tyrion and his last friends. Next minute they were all fighting for their lives. In a way it wasn't quite so bad as you might think. When you are using every muscle to, to the full, ducking under a spear point here, leaping over it there, lunging forward, drawing back, reeling round, you haven't much time to feel either frightened or sad. Tyrion knew he could do nothing for the others now. They were all doomed together. He vaguely saw the boar go down on one side of him, and Jewel fighting furiously on the other. Out of the corner of one eye he saw, but only just saw, a big calarmine pulling Jill away somewhere by her hair. But he hardly thought about any of these things. He only thought now, his only thought now was to sell his life as dearly as he could. The worst of it was that he couldn't keep to the position in which he had started under the white rock. A man who is fighting a dozen enemies at once must take his chances wherever he can. Must dart in wherever he sees an enemy's breast or neck unguarded. In a very few strokes, this may get you quite a distance from the spot where you began. Tyrion soon found that he was getting further and further to the right, nearer to the stable. He had a vague idea in his mind that there was some good reason for keeping away from it, but he couldn't now remember what the reason was, and anyway he couldn't help it. All at once everything came quite clear. He found he was fighting the Tarkhan himself. The bonfire, what was left of it, was straight in front. He was, in fact, fighting in the very doorway of the stable, for it had been opened and two Kellermines were holding the door, ready to slam it shut the moment he was inside. He remembered everything now, and he realized that the enemy had been edging him up to the stable on purpose ever since the fight began. And while he was thinking this, while he was still fighting the Tarkhan as hard as he could, a new idea came into Tyrion's head. He dropped his sword, darted forward in under the sweep of the Tarkhan's Tarkan's scimitar, seized his enemy by the belt with both hands and jumped back into the stable, shouting, "'Come in and meet Tosh yourself!' There was a deafening noise, as when the ape had been flung in. The earth shook and there was a blinding light. The Calarmine soldiers outside screamed, "'Tosh! Tosh!' and banged the door. If Tosh wanted their own captain, Tosh must have him. They, at any rate, did not want to meet Tosh. For a moment or two, Tyrion did not know where he was or even who he was. Then he steadied himself, blinked, and looked around. It was not dark inside the stable as he had expected. He was in strong light. That was why he was blinking. He turned to look at Rishta Tarkan, but Rishta was not looking at him. Rishta gave a great wail and pointed. Then he put his hands before his face and fell flat, face downward on the ground. Tyrion looked in the direction where the Tarkan had pointed, and then he understood. A terrible figure was coming toward them. It was far smaller than the shape they had seen from the tower, though still much bigger than a man, and it was the same. It had a vulture's head and four arms. Its beak was opened and its eyes blazed. A croaking voice came from its beak. Thou hast called me into Narnia, Rishta Tarkan. Here I am. What hast thou to say? But the Tarkan neither lifted his face from the ground nor said a word. He was shaking like a man with a bad hiccup. He was brave enough in battle, but half his courage had left him earlier that night when he first began to suspect that there might be a real tosh. The rest of it had left him now. With a sudden jerk, like a hen stooping to pick up a worm, Tosh pounced on the miserable Rishta, tucked him under the upper of his two right arms, tucked him under the upper of his two right arms. Then Tosh turned his head sideways to fix Tyrion with one of his terrible eyes, for of course, having a bird's head, he couldn't look at you straight. But in, immediately from behind Tosh, strong and calm as the summer sea, a voice said, Be gone, monster, and take your lawful prey to your own place, in the name of Aslan and Aslan's great father, the emperor, over the sea. The hideous creature vanished, with the Tarkan still under its arm, and Tyrion turned to see who had spoken. And what he saw then set his heart beating as it had never been, as it had never beaten in any fight. Seven kings and queens stood before him all with crowns on their heads, and all in glittering clothes. And the kings wore fine mail, as well as had their swords drawn in their hands. Tyrion bowed courteously. Tyrion bowed courteously, and was about to speak when the youngest of the queens laughed. He stared hard at her face, and then gasped with amazement, for he knew her. It was Jill, but not Jill as he had last seen her, with her face all dirt and tears, and an old drill dress half slipping off one shoulder. Now she looked cool and fresh 
as fresh as fresh as if she had just come from bathing. And at first he thought she looked older, but then didn't, and he could never make up his mind on that point. And then he saw that the youngest of the kings was Eustace, but he also was changed as Jill was changed. Tyrion suddenly felt awkward about coming among these people with the blood and dust and sweat of a battle still on him. Next moment he realized that he was not in that state at all. He was as fresh and cool and clean, and dressed in such clothes as he would have worn for a great feast at Care Paravel. But in Narnia your good clothes are never your uncomfortable ones. They knew how they knew how to make things that felt beautiful as well as looking beautiful in Narnia. And there was no such thing as starch or flannel or elastic to be found from one end of the country to the other. Sire, said Jill, coming forward and making a beautiful curtsy, let me make you known to Peter the High King over all kings in Narnia. Tyrion had no need to ask which was the High King, for he remembered his face, though here it was far nobler from his dream. He stepped forward, sank on one knee, and kissed Peter's hand. High King, he said, you are welcome to me. And the High King raised him and kissed him on both cheeks as a High King should. Then he led him to the eldest of the queens, but even she was not old. And there were no gray hairs on her head and no wrinkles on her cheek, and said, Sir, this is that lady this is that lady Polly who came into Narnia on the first day, when Aslan made the trees grow and the beasts talk. He brought him next to a man whose golden beard flowed over his breast, and whose face was full of wisdom. And this, he said, is the Lord Diggory, who was with her on that day. And this is my brother, King Edmund, and this is his sister, the Queen Lucy. This is my sister, the Queen Lucy. Sir, said Tyrion, when he had greeted all these, if I have read the chronicle aright, here there should be another. Has not your majesty two sisters? Where is Queen Susan? My sister Susan, answered Peter shortly and gravely, is no longer a friend of Narnia. Yes, said Eustace, and whenever you've tried to get her to come and talk about Narnia or do anything about Narnia, she says, what wonderful memories you have. Fancy you're still thinking about all those funny games we used to play when we were children. Oh, Susan, said Jill, she's interested in nothing nowadays except nylons and lipstick and invitations. She always was a jolly sight to she always was a jolly sight too keen on being grown up. Grown up indeed, said the Lady Polly. I wish she would grow up. She wasted all her school time wanting to be the age she is now, and she'll waste all the rest of her life trying to stay that age. Her whole idea is to race on to the silliest time of one's life as quick as she can, and then stop there as long as she can. Well, don't let's talk about that now, said Peter. Look, here are lovely fruit trees. Let us taste them. And then for the first time Tyrion looked about him and realized how very queer this adventure was. Have a good day, friends.